now. How many men we got in the house? Amen. Yeah. Raise your hand if you're a man. Amen. Amen. Now, how many man worshipers do I have in the house? Yeah. Men who worship God. Men who worship God. Men who love God. I'm going to tell you the truth, man. It's just between us, all right? When a man start worshiping God, that turns a woman on. I'm telling you, the, the, the man that worships the most gets the hottest girl. I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you why. That's not just a joke. But see, a sister wants to know that when stuff goes bad in the house, that you got a connection with the father. They don't have time to play with a cute brother. I'm telling you, they don't have time to pray with somebody who's too macho to realize that there is a God, that there is someone greater. Amen. So I'm telling you now, you want to get the girl, you better start worshiping. Is that all right? God is good, isn't he? I was, um, before I get started, I was talking to my son a couple of weeks ago, and he asked me a very interesting question. He asked, he said, Dad, can you, sell, can you tell me something that you've learned about Christ this year that has blown your mind? My son is only 23 years old. But he said, can you tell me something that you have learned about Christ this year that has blown your mind? And I really have to think about that because I do a lot of, you know, study especially about the gospel and about Christ. And I thought about that thing, and I answered him, and I said, well, son, the thing that has surprised me the most this year is how much Christ I see in the Old Testament and how much God, Jehovah, I'm looking at in the New Testament. And then when I look at that and when I think about that, I see how parallel that is to my life. The older I get and the more mature I get in Christ, I see how much Christ I had in my old life. When I, when I was out there doing everything under the sun, when I was doing anything without restriction, when I was disobedient to my parents, to my mom and dad who's sitting right there praying for me, now that I look back, it was Christ who kept me, who watched over me. And because of that, back in the day, when I, I could care less about church and I could care less about Christ and this all stuff, worship and all that stuff, I'm telling you, it was Christ who saved me, and now I have fellowship with the Father. So it was Christ in the old, and now I see God in the new. In the study of psychology, I don't know how many of you have heard of something called a locus of control. Locus of control. Maybe I'm the only one. This is a personality trait, okay, that says that certain people, actually all of us, look at life a certain way. A person with an internal locus of control believes that the outcome of their life results from their own actions and their own behaviors. It's what you do that makes the difference in your life. In other words, I work hard, I got my degree, I did this, so therefore I deserve that. That's an internal locus of control, okay? It works both ways, too. A person may say, I didn't work hard enough. I didn't study for the quiz. I didn't do this, so therefore, I'm suffering the things that I'm suffering today. A person that has an internal locus of control is a person that I think of a, a man that, that has this swag that, that says, you know, I can make things happen. There are a lot of guys out here that says, you know, I'm Mr. Make it happen. You know, I make it happen, you know. The, the, the baby runs out of milk, and you go like, bam, you know, there it is. And the, the, the car breaks down, and you like, bam, you know, there it is. I, I make it happen, okay? The, 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 the sheriff shows up at your door, puts a note on your door, and says, you got about three days to get out. Okay, what you do, Mr. Make It Happen? You go find a spot, you go furnish it. By the time the sheriff shows up, you're already out of that spot. Your family don't even know what happened. Mr. Make It Happen. We are, I don't have not one Mr. Make It Happen right now. Yeah. Oh, y'all some shy brothers. All right, all right. There are no Mr. Make It Happens in here. All right? Maybe one or two. What about the sisters? Miss Get Her Done. When you look at a sister, always got herself together. It's like, it seemed like this sister just always have her hair tight. It could be the last day of the month or whatever. And it's like the hair is just right. Amen? 
Have you ever a Miss Gitter? Just she just gets it done. On the, in the workplace, she she just owns the job. Miss Gitter done. This person has an internal locus of control. They work. They live by this mantra. They say you reap what you sow. In other words, my results come from my behavior, and my results come from my actions. And then they believe that they are who they are, and they are where they are because of decisions, decisions that they made. On the other hand, you've got people who have an external locus of control. These people believe that the outcomes of their life is based upon something that they cannot control. The economy is bad, that's why I'm broke. The economy is good, that's why I got a little something. They blame the stuff in their life based on, on the external rather than the decisions that they made. They, they say things like this, like, it was meant to happen. How many, you know, you suffered some hardship, something fell, you know, uh, you, you had a break, break up or something, and it was like, it was just meant to happen. That's an external locus of control. The economy is bad. That's an external locus of control. You believe that your life is the way it is because you cannot manipulate a circumstance. But I can't, I can't speak for you. I can't speak for you. But I know that if you drive 90 miles per hour on the freeway and you get caught by a cop, you don't blame God for that. That's your decision. If, she, if you keep showing up late to work like you do and end up getting fired, don't blame God for your decision. If you yourself think of yourself as a socialite, as a socialite like we have here in Tampa, and then get mad because the news media is parked outside your door, those are decisions you made. Don't blame God. And so God does not deserve blame for our poor judgment. Am I right about it? So who controls what in your life? Who do you blame for the stuff that's going on in your life? There are some things that you need to do, and there are some things that you need to take care of without going into prayer. I'm going to just be real. No need in you going into some deep prayer. Ah, oh, Father, I need you in the name of Jesus and all this crazy stuff. You just got to take care of it. You've been asking God and praying to God for, to fix your credit for eight and a half years, and credit still ain't fixed. All you got to do is pay your bills. Amen. All you got to do is pay some, uh, call some bill collectors and be like, hey, can I just send you $5 a, a month to things get better? Amen. Get you a game plan. A game plan. Amen? There's some things that you can control. We're talking about delivering the vision. And I'm going to give you some steps, and we're going to go home. Delivering the vision. Get you a game plan. Amen. Avoid the malls. Amen. If you got some issues, you know, with, with some money problems, um, avoid the malls. Amen. Stop getting your hair done every week. Instead of getting five tracks in your hair, get one. J just get a bang. Just, just get a bang, you know. On the, on the other hand, on the other hand, some things in your life you cannot control because God is in complete control. Amen. Things that benefit you the most have nothing to do with you. Take me to Ephesians 2 and 8 and look at the screens. For it is by grace, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Take me to John 15 and 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. There are some things in your life that you have complete you have no control, but God is in full control. Thank you. You have no control over grace. You have no control over mercy. You have no control over love, God's amazing love. You have no control over whether or not he answers your prayer. But God is saying all the time, that's on me. That, that's on me. My grace is on me. You have no control over salvation. That's me. You have no control over redemption. That's me. You have no control over election. God said, that's me. And so here it is. Some things in life you got to take care of. You got to do it. Quit blaming God. Some things in life you can't control. It's all on God. But there are other things that you have to partner 
with God. Are you following me? You've got to partner with God. You've got to collaborate with the Lord. You've got to participate with him. And so is the case with this fellow named Bartimaeus, who has a vision but has no sight. Such is the case with Bartimaeus. He has a need, but he needs a partner. He can't do it on his own, and God is not going to do it unless he demonstrates a level of faith. And we're still waiting on our delivery. But I'm going to tell you now, Bartimaeus knew how to get delivery for his vision. Some things you have got to make up in your mind, I'm going to participate with God. This is going to be a God thing. And so, therefore, when we look at the, the scripture and Bartimaeus, the Bible does not lend itself to giving you a lot of background about this fellow. It just tells you that his name is Bartimaeus and tells you his father's name, and that's about it. We don't know if he was born blind. We don't know if he became blind. We have no idea, you know, what was his circumstance other than he's just sitting on the side of the road. But I'm letting you know that if the Bible does not think that it matters to you whether or not he was born blind or anything about his background, I want you to know that no matter where you come from, no matter what background, no matter if you came from a poor house, no matter if you came from a one-parent home, I'm telling you now, God is able to deliver your vision. And so in order for us to deliver the vision, we have to think like Bart. Let's just call him Bart. Bart the man is Bart, all right? What did Bart do? And what did he do that can show us how to deliver the vision? Number one, he cried out persistently. He cried out persistently. He acted out. In verse 47, it reads, and he began to cry out. Oh my goodness, you can't see that. He began to cry out. Even if I got my application denied, you ought to continue to cry out. You need to just go back, regroup, get your, work, get your paperwork together, and begin to cry out. Even if you invited relatives to church and they just won't come, continue to just cry out. Why are you giving up now? Be persistent and cry out. Even, you ha even if you haven't been on a real date in 28 months, 33 months, or something crazy like that, I'm telling you, you can cry out to the Lord. Can I get a witness right there? He said if you ask seek and knock, I'll do it for you. And so if your vision is not urgent to you, hear me well, if your vision is not an urgent matter to you, it won't be an urgent matter to God. If your vision is not an, a serious matter to you, you cry out today and you forget about it for the next 30 days. You told someone you was, you was about to do this, you are about to open that, you about to write this, you about to do that. Six months later, you done forgot about it yourself. If it's not serious to you, it's not serious to God. He cried. He cried, and guess what? He cried the more. I wish you could see that, but trust me on this one. He cried the more. You've got to follow up and follow through. That's all that's saying. You need to follow up and follow through on your vision. And I guarantee you this, if you begin to cry out, and if you begin to cry out the more, not just one time, but continue to cry out the more, Jesus is always walking. Jesus is always moving. And it is your cry that he begins to hear. And you can miss out on the biggest miracle of your life by not crying out. Number two, he cast away his coat purposely. He cast away his coat. That water tastes good. He cast away his coat purposely. The Bible says in verse 50, and he casting away his garment. 
casting away his coat. Listen, y'all, don't get lost on this. I'm telling you, there's revelation right here. The coat that he had on represented a system that provided for him just enough, but not enough to get him to his next level. It represented layers that were on him that he didn't need. Some of us got some layers on us. You got some coat relationships that you really just don't need. You think you need it, but you really don't. I'm telling you now, get rid of the coat. It is a, a relationship layer that you don't need. It is a fear layer that you're holding on to that you do not need. It is the coat that will make you unwilling to risk your own skin. Because the coat covers your skin. The coat covers your skin, right? Yes. But I'm going to tell you this. For you, especially entrepreneurs, listen to this. No one will invest in your vision if you do not have any skin in the game. If you're not willing to risk something valuable, if you're not willing to risk something, if you're not willing to let go of something lesser so you can get rid of, so you can gain something greater, nobody is, Christ is not going to invest in your vision. Try to buy a house. Try to buy a house in this day and age with zero, zero dollars down. You could get away with that like seven years ago. Try to do it today. Try, in my line of work, I work in real estate, and sometimes, you know, the management team, we get very desperate, all right? The houses aren't moving or whatever. And so, you know, we go out and we say, hey, listen, uh, we'll give you this house. We rent homes, right? We'll give you this house for $99 down, and that's all. That's all it takes for you to move. $99 down. You don't have to pay your first month rent, no big security deposit. I'm giving you this house, okay? The problem, if it never fails, I've seen it for the last three years. The folks you get the $99 deal to, they don't pay their rent. The folks that you give the $99 deal to, they'll move in with $99, and 60 days later, they haven't paid you a dime in rent and will move out. It's the folks that got some skin in the game, that got a full deposit, that'll stay there uh, two or three years. What are you willing to sacrifice is the question. I might lose, I might lose my coat. I might lose my coat, but what will you gain? You'll gain your vision. Ah, that felt good to me right there. I'm sorry, this, this thing is blessing me right now. I'll, I'll give up my coat for my vision. I'll give it up. I might lose my relationship coat. I may lose a dead-end job coat. I may lose uh, leaving a, a city. I may lose leaving a system that had me comfortable. But guess what? I got something to gain out of this. I want to talk to some people in here that have put something on the line. And you're believing God to do exactly what he told you he was going to do. If you take one step, God will show up. If you get out of your boat, I'm telling you now, you will not drown. If you launch into the deep, you're going to catch a harvest. My God, give God a praise right there. Give God, a, that's for you. That's for you. Step out of your boat. Launch into the deep. The last thing Bart did, he called him Lord. Everybody wake up. If you fell asleep during this, all right, I forgive you. But you, you got to listen to this, man. You, you got to catch this, okay? He called him Lord professingly. He professed that he is Lord. He said, Lord, that I might receive sight. I've already got a vision of who you are. 
but I need to know, can you give me sight? Now watch this. In one of the verses, I can't remember which one, it said that he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was walking by. You follow me? Jesus of Nazareth. And then he cried, catch this, he cried, Jesus, son of David. He did not cry Jesus of Nazareth. And then when he got in front of Jesus, he said, Lord. Y'all like, mm. break that down. Jesus of Nazareth was a common man. He was a carpenter. He was the dude who just grew up around the block that everybody knew. So he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. But he said, he's more than that. He's the son of David. There is a king. I guess I'm gonna get happy by myself. He said, there is a king in him. And then when Jesus called him to him, he didn't say, you're just an earthly king, man. He said, you're Lord. He, he could have said, I just want to see. But he said, Lord, I want to see. When you begin to exalt God above your vision and make him Lord, I guess he figured, you're Lord. That makes you creator, right? Your Lord, that makes you alpha. Your Lord, that makes you the beginning. Your Lord, that makes you a deliverer. Your Lord, that makes you God. You are Lord, and that makes you holy. You are Lord, and that got that got to make you king of kings. You are Lord, and that's got to make you mighty. You are Lord. And that's got to make you omnipotent. You are Lord. And that's got to make you righteous. You are Lord. And that's got to make you Savior. My God, he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. If you designed, if you created man and you gave him an eye, then something's wrong with me. Obviously, I got an eye so that I can see. You are the creator of the eye, so you can fix this eye. God is a mind fixer. He can fix hearts. I don't care what you lost, who you lost. He can give you peace. I don't care if you did get the, if the divorce did go through. You can get a peace on the inside. Because when you make him Lord, that's what he'll do for you. And so he said that I might receive sight. And I'm telling you now, God will not release the vision. He will not deliver the vision unto you until you get the right perspective of him. Until you get the right perspective of him. When, when uh, Bart realized that this same Jesus is the God of the New Testament, he had to see him as God. He had to see him as God. And he declared that you are Lord and I am not. I may have an internal locus of control. I may do things and make things happen. I might be Mr. Make It Happen. I might be Miss, what was it I called it? Miss Get Her Done. Yeah, you one of them. Miss Get Her Done. I just get her done. Don't worry about me. I'm going to just get her done. But you know what? In this circumstance, Bart said, you're Lord, but I'm about to supply my faith. And it is through his faith that he participated. It is through his faith that he became a partner. It is through faith that you collaborate with God. Are you following me? When was the last time you really got serious and just said, Lord? No, that's a, that's a serious question. When was the last time you really got serious and just cried out, Lord, help my children, Lord.
help my relationship, Lord. I'm about to lose my mind, Lord. I'm about to lose my job and my income, Lord. They're in the hospital, Lord. Everybody on their